move on to the next segment of our call. Thank, sorry, we're running five minutes late. Anne, you have a special guest. Will you please introduce yes, her? Yes, Caleb, um, if you wanted to come back on the video. Um, I had gotten an email last week or two weeks ago um, from another company who mentioned Seed Renaissance. And I went to his website and I started doing a little research on this guy. And I'm like, I have to have him on. He really, I mean, his website's called Seed Renaissance, but he is definitely a Renaissance man. He's a gardener. He's an author. And I'm going to quickly share. Well, actually, Caleb, would you like to say hello and maybe tell them something that I haven't told them, which is not much, but um, I've already ordered a couple of his books. Oh, we can't, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I'd like to share my screen real quickly here so everybody can see some of the books that he has. All these books are written by him. Um, he's got this series called The Forgotten Skills. I have uh, I've just ordered both these first two ones. I can't wait to get them. Um, he's got books on baking. He's got books on uh, making lotion. He's got books on cookbooks. He's got everything. He's also has a um, his website where I actually just ordered some seeds from and I got them today. I'll be showing those in a minute. And he also has his, his blog where you can read up about him and all about that so thank you Caleb and so this group that we have is the neighborhood food network and we're just a bunch of home gardeners so we're trying to inspire people to start growing more food in their backyards and become more self-sufficient which you seem to know a lot about and so can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in all this it sounds um, like well I I tell people that one of my spiritual gifts is eating. I love to eat. And I grew up in the uh, kitchens and gardens of my both my grandparents and my great grandparents on both sides. I'm the oldest grandchild on both sides. So I was lucky to be able to do that. And food just tastes very different and has different nutritional properties when you grow it yourself. And I do want to just agree with what was said a moment ago that um, nutrition is the key if you have health issues then you need to look at your nutrition and so all of this you know every everybody's got some health issue that they need to address so yeah i couldn't agree more i was misdiagnosed well i had severe depression and i was just given medication and i finally just started to do a little deep dive on my own and it was what i was eating and autoimmune. Anyway, we could, we could talk a lot about that, but I will have some uh, some tips I want to share with having people to help people with their own gardening. Hopefully everyone is at least thinking about growing something for themselves. Should we jump right into that? Or? We should. Okay. So I just want to, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I want to talk about when to plant things, where to plant things what to plant and why to plant. So um, let's jump into when to plant. Uh, I, I, is the, this is a nationwide group, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So I'm in the Rocky Mountain West and it's important for everyone to understand when their average last frost date is. And I think most gardeners have a sense of when their average last frost date is. For example, in Sacramento, California, the average last frost date of the spring season is the first week of March. And where I live in the on the bench of the Rocky Mountains, it's the first week of June. And so I have a very short growing season. And in Sacramento, they have a longer growing season. And everyone's growing season is a little bit different. The reason that we need to know the average last frost date is because there are two, all vegetables can be divided into two categories. And those are cool season vegetables and hot season vegetables. And when I say season, what we're really talking about is the temperature of the soil. So generally speaking, cool soil vegetables are planted before your average last frost date. 
and the hot soil vegetables have to be planted after the last frost date. And if you're not sure what the average last frost date for your town or city is, then you can Google that and it will come up. So for example, almost all root vegetables need to be planted. If you're planting from seed, you need to do that while the soil is cool. So for most of the country, that means we could start about now. As soon as the soil- really? Yes, as soon as the soil can be worked in your garden, then you can plant carrots, onions, uh, potatoes, where I live are generally planted the middle of April, but right now from seed, you can plant carrots, onions, parsnips, beets, turnips, kohlrabi, celeriac, parsley root, radishes, peas, most perennial herbs you can begin to plant now, like oregano and marjoram and thyme and rosemary and the mints, plus all of your salad greens, like lettuce and the various kinds of spinaches and the various kinds of Asian greens, like mizuna and pak choy, and also all of the brassicas. Brassicas are a special group of vegetables that includes kale, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, collard greens, and also the cold season greens like miner's lettuce and salad burnet and sorrel and texel, those kinds of things you could plant um, beginning now. That doesn't mean they're going to pop up now. Let's just be clear about that. Can, does, it, does, it, does it help that the seeds get like stratified, cold stratified in some of them? Um, some of them have, I mean, there's a whole class of seeds that have to be cold stratified. Cold stratification means that these seeds have highest and best germination when they are exposed to temperatures between 32 and 45 degrees uh, for extended periods of time. So cold stratification like uh, lavender and lupine flowers and um, uh, a lot of the brassicas and things will do a little better if you put them in. I've got, I have a whole greenhouse that is filled full of cold stratification seeds. Um, rhubarb, those kinds of things, they all require some cold stratification. Okay, so I have two questions. One from the audience. Um, do you mean sowing the seeds directly outside right now yeah. or starting inside? No, I'm talking about directly outside. That's a good question. Okay, and the second one is, sowing these seeds outside, especially cabbage and Brussels sprouts, uh, cauliflower, broccoli, things like that. Am I, I'm just wondering if doing that earlier rather than planting them later could prevent some of the pests that, that people tend to get. I'm wondering if I've been planting those things too late and then therefore a lot of pests are out because it's too warm and all of that. Does, does, does planting them earlier help prevent any pest uh, problems? Absolutely. And as I said a moment ago, these are not all going to pop up if you start planting them now, but right. they are going to pop up on Mother Nature's schedule. Oh, lovely. So then you don't need to worry about it. You can, they will come up when the, when they, they are, seeds are very smart. So they will come up as soon as they feel that it is correct for them to come up and they're not all going to come up on the same day or anything else. And the pests, they want to, the seeds want to come out before the pests come out. I mean, they're, they will take care of all of this. So all we have to do is put them in the ground. The earlier, the better. Wow. I'm so excited. We can plant earlier than I thought. <laughs> I, yeah. So, um, some of the stuff I've been trying to start in my basement already because I have chickens, so I'm trying to grow some greens for them, and which is working great. But I I want to tell everybody I did try to do spinach inside, and it's not possible. It got to about this big and bolted. I have a little little bolt head, so I will not be growing spinach inside because I think that really needs to be outside in the cold. Spinach would prefer almost all of the salad greens would prefer to be outside in the cold. You can, if you want them to grow faster, you can put them in a cold frame or you can put them in a cloche or you can go to your local thrift store and get the largest glass vases that you can find for as cheap as possible, turn them upside down and plant underneath those right now if you want them to sprout very soon, very quickly. Now, does it matter if it still is, there's still a freeze between, I mean, because some places in February, even March, you can still get a freeze. Is it okay for these brassicas if there's still a freeze? 
Well, it's going to freeze at my house until the first week of June. I heard brassicas become sweeter because they have a chemical in them that helps like they're, it's like the antifreeze of the plant and it makes them sweeter. Well, all of these things that we have just talked about taste better when they are exposed to cooler temperatures and they taste more bitter and more starchy when they're exposed to hot temperatures. So this entire list of vegetables that we've just been through mm -hmm. um, definitely will taste better, will have fewer pests and is going to be healthier and stronger just because they they come out according to mother nature's schedule as opposed to us trying to start them indoors. Maybe they're getting leggy, maybe they're not. And then they go through a whole uh, transplant shock thing when we take them out of the house and put them outside because the temperature is very different outside. So it's easier to just let these things start outside. That's fantastic. And then, so things like tomatoes and peppers that need the warmth, would you recommend waiting until after the first freeze then and just planting them directly in the ground? So you have to wait for the hot soil vegetables. Those include beans, cucumbers, peppers, and tomatoes, sweet potatoes, melons, cantaloupes, corn, squash, pumpkins, and annual culinary herbs like cilantro and basil. None of those things withstand frost and none of those things are going to grow at all if your soil is too cool. Even if you don't have a frost, if your soil hasn't warmed up yet and you plant them either from seed or from starts, they're just going to sit there and do nothing until the soil reaches the appropriate temperature. So none of those things are planted from seed or from starts until after your average last frost date. So if you don't know when your average last frost date, that is where you need to start. Okay. And Valerie's asking, but if there's still snow on the ground and the ground is frozen, then how would you plant? You're, you're saying you wait until it's the soil is workable, right? As soon as the soil is workable. Okay. So that means when you have some days where the temperatures get up to 50 or 60, right? During the day, it's starting to warm a little bit during the it day. Means right? that you, it means that your soil has begun to unthaw. Unthaw. Okay. Yes. okay. And Valerie, we're supposed to be in the almost to 50 next week. So yeah, that's a, that's a possibility then. If it, if it freezes again after you've planted it, you don't need to worry about that. And if it's got frost, if it snows Yay. again, you don't need to worry about any of those things. Mother Nature will take care of that. You just relieved so much anxiety that I have had about gardening. I can't, I can't even tell you like what a relief this is. And I love the whole concept of just letting Mother Nature do its job, letting them grow. Like you put them in the ground and they will grow when they want to grow. I yeah. love that. That's like great parenting advice too, folks. <laughs> like well, one thing I want to tell everybody is that he has a website. It's, um, I will be sending out the link because it's kind of convoluted to, to say here right now, but he has a long list of seeds that he, he has curated and he, they're non-GMO. He's basically trying to keep some of these strains alive. And I just got my order today and I'm very excited Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I, C Caleb, I had like 82 tomato plants last year, so I'm basically um, very excited about it. But I will be, and his, and he's his prices for his seeds are so reasonable. Some are like a dollar fifty, some are like two dollars. So you just need to go there and check out all his things. And um, and they're all heirloom and they're all chemical free. Yay! That's so and wonderful. So I don't know, if you know much about Moms Across America, but we're basically been fighting Monsanto and GMOs for 12, 12 years. 12 years, yeah. I yeah. have a question about the, the Mormon aspect. I'm very fascinated with the Mormon, um, you know, I guess you could say cult culture. It's not just a religion, but it seems like a culture to me because we had a Mormon uh, gentleman on our street back in Mission Viejo and he shared that his entire garage was stocked with food in case there was ever an emergency, he could support the entire street for, you know, a couple of weeks at least, or a month or something. I think he had like a year's worth of food for, for a certain number of people. And, um, and so I just wanted to ask, is that something that's very common amongst the Mormons? And um, is that, do you practice that? Do you, can you mention that a little bit? Your books mention Mormon practices. Well, I'm I'm trying to get people to move away from, I mean, it is very common. We, we don't call ourselves Mormon. We call ourselves Latter-day Saints. And it's very, very common for Latter-day Saint people to um, 
to think about being prepared for emergencies. And I'm trying to get people to move away from thinking of self-reliance and preparedness as a garage full of freeze-dried and old freeze-dried and old things because we need enzymes. We need fresh food. We need enzymes. We need a garden. And um, it's better, always better to eat fresh than it is to buy a bunch of old freeze-dried things that you intend to just only use in an emergency. Really, really great. Yes, we absolutely need security. I often see on Facebook, I was trying to bring it up, but I can't see it right now. Pictures of, you know, a giant mansion and six cars in the front and, you know, high heels and fur jackets. Like we think we need this because of what's in the media, but we actually need is this. And it's a picture of a huge garden, right? And fruit trees, a small orchard and chickens. And that's, that's actually security and wealth and health and so we're really uh, on board with you. And that's why the Neighborhood Food Network you know, promotes people uh, growing food on their own street. So we appreciate your support in that. And uh, Pat, you have a, a question for Caleb? Sure. Um, Caleb, have you, um, where you live, grown um, honey berries? Yes. I, I'm in San Diego, which is used to be called Zone 9 and USDA is now calls it Zone 10 but I have a lot of microclimates in the area that I'm able to grow things, the, the bit, tiny bit of soil I have. And I got really excited looking at all the traditional medicinal uh, benefits of the berries and that they can live for 30, the plants can live for 30 years, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure in, in my subtropical climate, <laughs> Um, whether I should be planting on the north or south or east or west side of of a building, um, well, let's... And, you know the instructions from from the uh, grower that I just bought from it said, said that they're they're you know native native plants that I bought little native seedlings and. Um, I'm I'm very excited, but I I want to plant him in the right place. Do you have a question for him? Yeah, where yeah. what's what would be the right orientation, or southeast or west? Well, uh, all bear yeah, all berries. Uh, I think I think this segues nat na uh, nicely into the next section here that we want to talk about, which is where to plant things. But specifically to answer your question, all berries need full sun. Okay. All berries need full sun. So the, if it uh, there's a certain shade too there. But... Yes, but that's talking about survival, not berries. So you you need eight to ten hours of full sun. It takes uh, about twenty leaves on on honey berries. It takes about twenty leaves in full sun to create one berry. So you you need it in full sun. So you want it in a south facing uh, place. Oh. Um, I, you know, where I live, I have to grow, I have eight geothermal greenhouses. And so I have to grow mine in the greenhouse because my season is too short. And mine's but very long. That's where I put mine. It's so where to plant, let's talk about uh, generally where to plant things. Um, I think it's important to note that the first rule of thumb is that tallest things go on the north, shortest things go on the south. And it's a, you know, everything in between follows that rule. You don't put your corn on the south side of your tomatoes or the south side you don't put your tomatoes on the south side of your onions and you don't you don't put your parsnips on the south side of your uh you know ground cherries or something like that you so tallest things always go in the north shortest things go in the south seems kind of like that like you should be able to figure that out on your own but i see so many gardeners who violate that rule the next thing we need to know is we have some area of the garden that is for annuals. Annuals are things that you plant and they die the same year. And another area of the garden for perennials, what you plant once and they will grow and give you food for many, many years. Um, uh, the next thing I think people need to think about is, do you want an open plan garden or do you want garden boxes? And I used to tell everyone that garden boxes were a big waste of space because 
and time and money because you have to build or buy the box and then you have all this pathway space that kind of gets wasted but as i have uh grown a little older i've decided that sometimes sitting down on the box is a good thing <laughs> <laughs> it definitely the age starts to catch up to you especially if you spend a lot of time in the garden so you need to figure out what is best for you it gets harder every year to be on your hands and knees in the garden in the open plan garden it's good for your back but you don't want to you know we want to figure out what's going to best meet your needs I want to talk for a moment about where to plant as far as nutrient recycling in the garden Ooh. it's so important um you know, I'm completely chemical free, which means that I don't use any petrochemical fertilizers or anything. I, I don't want petroleum based products in my garden. And nutrient recycling used to be the way that everyone gardened. It simply means that you take your grass clippings and you take your, your tomato vines and your squash vines and you take the old leaves and you take everything that you can and you put it back into the garden and let it break down and become compost. If you're using grow boxes or garden boxes, all of that stuff goes into the middle layer of the box. The bottom of the box is wood chips, the middle layer is anything you can get your hands on that is free, that does not, that will eventually break down, like pine needles, pine cones, leaves, I took uh, all of my neighbor's Christmas trees and ground them up and put them in my boxes. Um, anything, you know, chicken manure, rabbit manure, guinea pig manure, horse manure, anything, any, anything that you know where they're being, what they're being fed and that it is clean and that it's not garbage that you can use that. Uh, kitchen scraps, organic kitchen scraps, all of that stuff. Anything that comes out of your garden that it would be thrown away or burned or whatever that will eventually turn into compost should go into the middle layer so that you're recycling nutrients right on your property so that you have good, healthy soil. Right. I have a question. I have this thought in my head that when I when somebody cuts the grass or uh, sometimes if we maybe not weeds, but mostly grass, if I take that grass with seeds in it and put it in the compost and then put it in my garden, aren't I putting basically grass seeds in my garden? Am I causing trouble for myself in the garden? Well, composting is a heat process and no seeds are viable after 140 degrees. So if you, and we're talking about putting this in the middle of the boxes, so you can put whatever you want, basically, into the middle of the boxes, and it's going to get very hot, and it's going to kill the weed seeds in the middle of that box. Now, that said, I, it'll certainly kill grass seeds. I've been doing this for decades. It certainly is not going to cause a problem because I only do weed-free gardening. I don't use, I don't allow weeds in my very large gardens, um, but you, you need to you know, if you've got something that is obviously filled full of weed seeds, then you wouldn't use that. But if you're going to, if there's going to be some seeds in there, all composting will kill that if the composting is done right, which is why I tell everyone to put it in the middle of the box, because there's no way to do it wrong if it's in the middle of the box. Wow, wonderful. Okay. Does it matter if a planter boxes are wood or metal? Do the metal ones get too hot in the hotter summers? That depends on where you live. Where I live, you should not use metal. And it's really becoming a problem because people don't understand and they're buying a lot of these metal and sometimes they're using the animal troughs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Put your hand on the side of one of those, you know, when it is 100 degrees outside and it's full sun, you will get a burn. It'll burn your fingers. And that is taking water out of your soil and the roots are getting too hot and that will certainly stunt plants. So I really think I all of my garden boxes are built out of free pallet wood. They're just recycled out of pallet wood. You can get free pallet wood wherever you are in the United States. And so, you know, I, I would I, imagine that that heat would kill the microbiome in the soil, too, or some of absolutely. them could impact them. Yeah. The earthworms, the microbiome, the mycorrhiza. Yes. Yeah, and Mark Dudla, our, our, one of our advisors for our Neighborhood Food Network, he's a regenerative organic farmer, says stay away from treated woods 
So it would be nice to know if those, um, those um, what do you call it, pallets that you're talking about, if they're treated or not. A lot of them are not because they're just cheap wood. Most pallet wood is not treated, but you can always tell if you know the difference. If you don't know the difference, go. you can go look it up. But pallet wood always has a, uh, treated wood always has a pattern on it. So you mm. can always tell treated wood from untreated wood. And we don't use any treated wood in the garden at all because I tell people, if you're going to grow your own food and then just put chemicals all over your own food, you might as well go to the grocery store because they'll, they'll give you chemical food for, you know, <laughs> that, that's what they offer. If you're going to grow your own, do it without chemicals. Okay. So, so I started, I started um, trying to teach a lot of people about all the things they're throwing in their garbage that they could be throwing into their compost. Yes. You know? All those nutrients they're throwing away. I, used, I did including... my whole garden with bo with cardboard boxes. It's six six thousand square feet, and I did the whole thing with cardboard boxes and over the grass. And then well, I did wood chips. I'm going to offer an opinion about cardboard boxes and news and newsprint. Uh oh. Uh, black ink in the United States is made out of soy, but colored ink all has heavy metals in it. And it's it, the, all of the colored ink is made with heavy metals. So I wouldn't put a new, you couldn't pay me to put a newspaper in my garden. And cardboard boxes are uh, made with PVA glue. And PVA glue is a plastic based glue. So I would not, oh I don't God. believe, I don't believe in putting any plastic based chemicals in my garden and any ink with heavy metal in my garden. So I just, a, just a, a thought i i know everyone on the internet says yes 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 newspaper cardboard newspaper cardboard but you have to think about what are the ingredients of those products because cardboard has ingredients and ink has ingredients and paper has ingredients you have to think about do you want those in your garden soil so what do you suggest instead of newsprint and and um cardboard um it depends i sub i mean just it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If if what you're trying to accomplish is a lasagna layer to block the weeds, then newsprint and uh, cardboard don't block rhizomatous weeds anyway. And weeds that are not rhizomatous are just going to be blocked. I, every My entire garden, which is one acre in size, and my backyard garden is one acre in size, the entire thing is wood chips, rough compost, which we just talked about, which is grass clippings, and then uh, you know, grass clippings and manures and whatever. And then on the top layer is finished compost. That's all I grow in. Wow. That's it. Okay. Grass clippings, wood chips, rough compost, compost manure, grass clippings, and then more like more re uh, refined okay. compost. It's three layers. The bottom layer is always wood chips. The middle layer is always rough compost, which I define as anything you can get for free that will slowly turn into soil. Mm -hmm. Anything, leaves, pine needles, grass clippings, garden waste, whatever. And the, But on the top, you need finished compost. Okay. We're just going to suggest though, if you, this, anything you can get for free thing, we'd like people to be discerning and not just get all kinds of food from restaurants that are using GMO ingredients, non-organic ingredients. If you're going to get, you know, compost from restaurants or people's trash or whatever, I would assert that making sure that it's organic would be super important. I guess I should clarify that when I say get for free, I mean, out of your own yard. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> like yeah, we know that's leaves off of your own trees, grass clippings that you know were not sprayed with chemicals because they're your grass clippings. And there's, if you have a garden, there's always waste that, you know, there's, there's dead plants at the end of the season. All of that stuff should go into the middle layer. So, you know, when you were talking about the raised beds and getting older, um, I had been given a lot of free hoop house wood, one by 10, that they were tearing the hoop houses down and I got a lot of free wood. So I started building double high and I was doing what you were saying on the bottom. I was putting all kinds of stuff from my yard and my garden, almost like a hoogle culture type situation. Yes. And then I threw in a lot of food scraps down there, you know, wood chips in there. And, and actually that bed, it's two years old now and it's doing pretty good. So yes. and it's kind of nice not to have to, to bend down for some, some yeah. of the time. You've used the magic word. All I grow in is modified hugo culture. I wasn't sure that you guys would know that word, so I didn't. Well, they say it. does. Uh, there's some people here who may not know. It's 
My Mason. entire garden is modified hugel culture. Uh, that's all I grow in. Hugel culture is the correct answer. <laughs> that's great. Can you explain that a little bit? We only, we're over time now, but if you just take a few minutes to explain that. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> um, hugel culture is a method of uh, low water organic gardening that was invented in Germany in the 1970s. And in Germany, where it's very, very green and it rains every day, they hugel culture in six foot tall mounds. They start with logs and then on top of the logs, they put limbs and branches. And on top of the branches, they put twigs. And on top of that, they put rough compost. And then on top of that, they put soil. But they have to have a lot of drainage. Where I live, it's very different. Where you guys live, it might work in six foot mounds. But where I live in the high, dry desert at 5,200 feet, there is no summer rain here. It does not rain where I live. Uh, that snows in the winter, there's absolutely no rain in the summer, there's no humidity. So 16 inches is what works for me, and you can't use logs in 16 inches. So I do, all of my beds are 16 inches deep, and they're, the bottom third is uh, wood chips, and the middle third is rough compost, and the top third is finished compost. That's How do you manage long... without the rain? Uh, oh, irrigation. Okay. You, in, where you when you live with no rain, you have to irrigate. <laughs> you yep. have to do you ever sleep. add do you ever add trace minerals in the form of seaweed? Lauren wants to know? Uh, no, because I use animal manures and I do nutrient recycling. So you don't need trace minerals if you are you don't need to buy anything if you are using those items. How many husbands love to hear that? You don't need to buy anything. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Well, we're trying not to buy things. The garden should feed you. you sh it should pay you. You're not supposed to pay the garden. Wow. We love that. Well, especially if you're saving your seeds, which are clearly you're doing because you're selling seeds, yes. but uh, then they're free every year. You don't have to pay for them if you're saving your own seeds and you are giving back. The whole garden is an ecosystem because you're growing food and then giving back to it. And then if you have uh, chickens like Ann does and is actually growing uh, crops to feed the chickens, the chickens then make the chicken poop, which gives back uh, nitrogen into your soil as well. There's like the whole cycle with the animals. I did that with rabbits. I would go out every morning and pick the the weeds from my garden and herbs, a couple handfuls of herbs and feed them to my rabbits. And then their rabbit poop was the most nutritious poop you can have. It's very high in potassium and magnesium and it's nice. cold. So you can put it right in the garden when you need to and um, made fabulous tomatoes, you know, with uh, just a little couple pellets of rabbit poop in the bottom with a little bit of Epsom salts and some, yeah, um, uh, an egg, you know, eggshell. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't gonna mention this either, but since you brought it up, I will say that rabbits or guinea pigs, they are the key to having a weed-free garden. I the, the thing I hear the most from people is that they don't want to garden anymore because they were forced to weed when they were children. So the way to resolve that is to get guinea pigs or to get rabbits, or in my case, to get both of them and never ever say to your children or grandchildren that they are weeding the garden. Just say, we feed our animals self-reliantly, which I do. I don't buy any food from the store for my animals. I feed them completely off of our property year round. And wow. you just say, oh, it's time to feed. So let's go out and find some weeds in the garden. And they don't even know that they're weeding in the garden. They're just so happy to go feed the rabbits and their guinea pigs. That is adorable. I love that. Right. Now I got to get some rabbits. <laughs> and there's lots of places you can get free rabbits. You don't have to buy Oh, them. I know. Uh, well, I, had a, I have a question and I saw it on one of your pages today as I was, and I don't remember where it was, but you were talking about saving seed, which is very important. And yes. I saw a picture of kale and I was wondering, do you have to, kale? is kale a biennial and you have to keep it in the ground for two years to get the seeds the second year? Because I've had kale and I've never gotten seeds. Um, some kale is biennial and some kale is not bi biennial. It depends on the cultivar and it also depends on how soon you plant it. So right now we're planting everything, even though there's 18 inches of snow outside, we're planting everything because if you plant some of those brassicas early enough, then you can get seeds in the same year. And if you don't, then yeah. you have to, then they're biennial. So it's a complicated question. Seed saving is complicated and the rules are different for every single vegetable. And I do have the largest, I did write the largest book ever published on this subject. So if you really want to know how to save heirloom seeds, you can go, look up my book that's a whole i'm other... going to be sending out the link to all your books tomorrow so so i bought these beets from you 
and I have never been successful at beats. And now I'm thinking it is I need to get them in the ground pretty soon. Yes, you do. Beets like a cool soil. They have best germination with, with cool soil. So if you've never had success with beets, now is the time to get them in the ground. Yay. All right. If your soil can be worked right now, now is the time to get them in the ground. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. But I know. It, is everybody it, it, I was I, I sent out the e-blast today and I was telling everybody, oh, are you getting excited because you're getting your seed catalogs? Well, now I'm just getting excited because now I can start gardening. It's fantastic. If folks, if you're on the call and you have not planted uh, a garden, if you have not, if you're not growing food, we strongly encourage you to start this year. What would be the the uh, first, like the easiest type of crop to plant? The most rewarding. What do you think? Um, okay. I think you should think about planting what would save you the most money. What it is you really want to eat is what you should plant. And I think that no matter who you are, even if you don't have a garden, put some perennial thing into your yard, like a raspberry plant, some strawberry plants, a peach tree. Find some, even if you don't want a garden, find something that your children and grandchildren can harvest out of your backyard. Because if you don't teach them to eat out of the backyard, nobody else is going to do that. That's so true. And can you, can we plant raspberry and peach trees in the spring because yes. I I heard it was in the fall. Do we you, can we you plant can them in the spring? Certainly plant them in the spring, yes. Okay, great. All right. I have um, another does question. Does it have to be after the frost? No. For most people? It can be before the frost? Yes. You can plant them while they're dormant. Oh, okay, great. All right. I'm doing that. Somebody cut down my raspberry bushes and my peach trees didn't make it when I first planted them. I only have a couple apple trees. So I'm gonna try again this spring. And get, try to get, get it done right. Good, yeah. good. Awesome. Uh, oh, wait, Mark has a question and then we'll wrap up. Do you have any no-till gardening like crimp rye? Do you do that? I only do no-till no gardening. Hugo culture is all no-till. And um, I will say that my garden is uh, 60 to 70% uh, perennial and self-seeding. And that's only possible in no-till. That's how everyone used to garden. This idea that we replant everything from scratch every year is nonsense and not the way that it was done historically. So no-till is the only way to go. Okay. And so some crops like kale, you would just leave in the ground, right? You You don't pull them up. You just plant them once. My kale, uh, my dwarf blue Siberian kale, plant it once. It has planted itself ever since. Oh my gosh. You just keep it in the same area? You don't have to replant it every year? No, it moves. It moves itself. I mean, it moves. <laughs> All of these, these plants kind of move themselves about six feet every year. They wander around. What? That's so they're, so they're cool. self They're self-seeding. They're self-seeding. Yeah, that's. I mean, so I mean, wonderful. raspberries do move themselves too, but and fruit trees, they'll they move themselves by making their roots go out longer. They don't physically move their location, but sure. no, in no-till gardening, your garden will plant a lot of it, stuff. Will plant itself. That's sort of how it used to all be done. Oh my gosh, you got I did me have a lot of tomatoes. What I, I did have a lot of tomatoes come up on their own. Yes, they do. But this this only works if it's heirloom seeds because right. heirloom seeds are the only kind of seeds you can save seed from. You can't save F1 generation hybrid seeds. So you got if you want to do this, you got to make sure you're planting heirloom seeds. Yeah, so and can you show his website again for Renaissance seeds please so we can make sure people are uh, supporting this brilliant man and and and, and I you. and I will be sending out the links to everything um tomorrow. And I ordered um, I ordered a couple of his books today, so I'm very excited to get them. They talk about the um, self-reliance and um, the seed saving. Oops, sorry. That's I'm great. Sorry. And I see that you have flowers in there too, Caleb. I'm guessing you suggest planting flowers in within your your in within your garden so that bees and pollinators come. If you want a good garden, you've got to have good pollinators. It's so perfect. I grow the anise hiss up here. That comes back every year. And man, the bees go crazy for it. Yes. Yeah. The bumblebees especially. And it makes wonderful tea. Oh, I, tea. Wonderful. All right. Well, it's 8, 15, 15 minutes over. We need to go. Thank you Caleb, so much. Caleb, I would time, like Caleb. to maybe sometime have you back, if you wouldn't mind. I'm yes. happy we, to come back. 
Um, yes, I'm so excited. Oh, I just want to ask one quick question. I have Ella campaign seeds. I try, I started them indoors last year. They never flowered. Yeah, that's because Ella campaign uh, needs some cold stratification. So the that's sooner you plant Ella campaign, if you plant Ella campaign too late in the spring, it's yep, right there. <laughs> There's a whole label on that package explaining how to plant those. And he, and he gives you a an instruction sheet with the seeds that they, they come in. I was very excited. Now when I get my mail, I shake it and I'm like. <laughs> that's wonderful. All right. So, well Thank you very much. But before you, before you, everybody uh, clocks off, I just have to say thank you very much, Caleb. Uh, we want to draw your attention, folks, to a new article on our website, The Plastic Chemicals Hiding in Your Food from Consumer Reports. They found uh, BPAs and um, phthalates in grocery store food and in fast food. And uh, we want you to draw your attention to this website. All the more reason to grow your own food. Um, is is to avoid these types of chemicals. And also, please, please, please go to Moms Across America and click on this button. It says sign our fast food petitions. We have uh, six petitions for you to sign. Don't just sign one. We want you, we really want you to sign the first one, Panera Bread, to add, to ask them to put glyphosate on their no-no list. But we want you to sign all of them because Arby's was second. Chick-fil-A had the highest cadmium levels in their French fries. Sonic Burger had the highest lead in their uh, burger, in and out burger um, had, oh no, I'm sorry. Chick-fil-A had the-, the Contraceptive. The, uh, contraceptive, aviary contraceptive. Yes, and in and out burger had the highest levels of cadmium in their French fries. And Burger King and Starbucks, their Impossible Foods products had twice the amount of glyphosate as the meat counterparts. So we want to tell these companies that they need to do something about quality control in their food and we have um, really need a lot more signatures. So folks, if you'd please sign, we would like yeah, to- Yeah, so would you please sign these and then please share them? And yeah, share. I believe share, once share, share. you go in and fill out the first one, it kind of auto fills throughout all the other five and it's super easy to do, so. Super easy, just takes a minute, easy peasy. There you go. Glyphosate levels in Panera Bread's 439. By comparison, Chipotle only had four. So uh, much higher levels of glyphosate because of their bread. So please sign the petitions. Thank you very much, everybody, for being on this super informative call tonight. Thank you for everybody on Facebook sharing this. We really hope that you will share this uh, fantastic call and information. And we so appreciate um, you know everybody for contributing to the chat and for your comments and your questions. We learn something from all of you every week. Every single week I learn something new and today was extra, extra because of you, Caleb. So thank you. It was. Yeah. Thank you. I'm like, I'm like, where's my boots? It's dark out, but I don't care. Yeah, I know. I want to get planting right. I'm like, what's happening this weekend? I'm going out to plant. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Caleb. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. We'll see you next week. All right. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody.